All right. Good morning, everybody. Go ahead and open up to Revelation chapter 5. <coughs> Excuse me. And bear with me, please, as I uh, was up for a few hours last night, not feeling 100% myself. So, but God is gracious. <laughs> His grace is sufficient. So let us get into uh, chapter 5 of Revelation. We have been in this eschatology study for uh, almost about a little over seven months now or so. So we have laid the groundwork through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, uh, certainly Jesus' teaching on the all the discourse being the key to what we are believing and what we are teaching here um, at the church, um, at First Baptist here. We have our timeline that's been built that we're going through, and we'll continue to build on that as we get into the next couple of chapters, certainly into chapter 6 as we get into the seals and then into the trumpets and to the vials. Remember the day of the Lord being the key. Um, so what are some of the things? What's, what is the sign of the day of the Lord about to happen? The abomination of desolation. Okay, so there will be the abomination of desolation before that. Okay, correct? So we are not of the mindset of uh, dispensational or the pre-tribulation rapture. We're not teaching or, or understanding or seeing that Scripture teaches uh, that there's going to be a secret rapture that could happen today or at any time. Kind of like the Left Behind movie, right? The Left Behind series, if you're familiar with that stuff. We believe that scriptures say that there are certain signs that must happen before the day of the Lord, which the day of the Lord <clears throat> consists, remember, of two things that happen simultaneously. Jesus comes in the clouds from heaven to gather together the elect, to gather together those who are saved, and that would be called what? What's that called, the gathering up? Everybody's the day of the Lord. Lord quiet and shy and timid today. Hmm? The day of the Lord. Sure, at the day of the Lord, what, the first resurrection or the rapture, right? That's the first resurrection or the rapture. So that happens when Christ comes at the day of the Lord. That happens and the righteous are saved, uh, but then also the wrath of God is poured out, okay? And Jesus says, as in the days of Noah or as in the days of Lot, the same day that Noah entered into the ark, the flood came and took, took all the wicked away. The same day that <coughs> Lot left Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, fire and brimstone rained down and, and judged and punished the wicked. So it's the same day, same event, same time. Okay, so <clears throat> we have that in the seven-year period, somewhere after, like Duff said, the abomination of desolation, which happens in the middle of the week when we go back to Daniel. <clears throat> so what are some of the signs then? If we believe that there are signs that will happen before Jesus' return, what are some of those signs? Good. Both those are good. So you said abomination of desolation, which is good. The revealing of the Antichrist. Good. Revealing of the Antichrist, which is the abomination of desolation, right? He sets up in the temple of God um, and sits on the throne of God and says, I am God, builds a, a statue, um, a, an idol of himself, and tells the people of the world to, to worship him, which we will get into more as we go further on in the, in the book of Revelation. The sun and moon and stars being darkened, which is what um, Catherine is alluding to is the signs, in fact, of the day of the Lord. Go back to Joel 2.32, <laughs> Acts 2, um, so many places in the Old, you know, Old Testament that you will see the sun and the moon and the stars will be darkened before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So the sun, moon, and stars will be darkened before Jesus comes. Okay, so if there's going to be a temple that the Antichrist is going to set himself up in, then what must there be in order for that to happen? A temple, okay? So there must be a temple that is going to be built in Jerusalem where there's going to be sacrifices that the Jews are going to start the Old Testamental sacrificial system again and the Antichrist is going to come in the middle of that seven-year period and put a stop to those things, okay? So that means those things must be in place. So certainly we believe that signs would be if we see, um, you know, the building of a tabernacle, the building of a temple going on in Jerusalem, uh, that will tell us that we have started the timeline here somewhere, okay? So, all that is to review a little bit of our, our over stuff, because I know, Frank and John, I know you guys are jumping in here late to the <clears throat> to the game, but um, a lot of stuff that we can talk about later, and, and again, if you have a different view or a different understanding of, of eschatology and of end times things, uh, that is that is okay, okay? We can still have fellowship, we can still uh, we still serve the same Lord. This doesn't have to do, your thoughts on eschatology have nothing to do with your salvation, correct? correct. Salvation comes by faith alone, right? Grace alone, your faith alone, and Christ alone. So believing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is what saves you. 
Um, not you don't have to have a proper view of every single doctrine in scriptures, right? Because none of us are going to be right on everything. Correct? Okay. So have, have we learned that yet? Uh, yeah. And we want to be open and receptive to what the Holy Spirit may may want to teach us and may want to do. Holy Spirit certainly guided me and directed me through through scriptures and studying deep studies of scriptures within probably eight, nine, ten years ago to change me on my view of this, of eschatology that we're going through. I used to be in that, you know, left behind pre-trip camp and all those things. So um, certainly I know a lot of you, we've talked about soteriology and election and, and predestination and foreknowledge of God and all those things where we've got different views now and different understandings of that. So certainly as we mature, the Lord may change our understanding of things, okay? So we want to be receptive to what the Holy Spirit may want to do with that, okay? So we remain open and we remain to teach, Brian and I remain to teach as we see the scriptures, you know, revealing these things to us and, and seeming to, to put it together and, and that it all fits and there's not, you know, problems and issues with certainly not minor details. Remember, the, the more detailed you get, the less dogmatic you should get because if you're going to sit here and say, well, you know, this means this, and this means this, and it's so sensational. There's so many people that do that. Um, it pins you down on a lot of things. We're talking about the overarching things. We're talking about the big things. Smaller things we can speculate on. We can say, oh, this is what I think. This is just my opinion. This is what this may be. This, you know, scholars think it may be this, and maybe this. But the big things are, some of the big things are what? Jesus is coming again, right? We're all in agreement. The Bible says Jesus is going to come back again. Okay, so he's been, he came once, he's coming a second time, and there's two comings, and that's what the scriptures say. So that's why we have a problem splitting it up to say, well, there's multiple stages of his second coming. And, but it's not really a second, third, and fourth, and fifth coming. It's all part of the second coming. So a lot of those things uh, we tend to stay away from. Okay, so as we've been in the book of Revelation now, we have come through... John writing these letters to seven churches in Asia, which were churches in the first century. And Jesus has messages for each of those. And certainly there's application for us in every one of those letters, right? Certainly think of being careful of false teachers and false doctrines coming into your church. Think about uh, when he said, you know, you've lost your first love. Get back to your first love. You know, your, your passion and your desire and your fire to be a testimony, to be a witness, to evangelize, to share the gospel. Um, you know, to, to do what he has commanded us to do and told us to do. So many other things that we've seen in that. And then when we get to chapter 4, it says, after these things, he says, he was taken up into heaven, <clears throat> where it says he was in the spirit, and Jesus showed him the things that would be to come, which would be future things. So we've been going through that. We have seen in chapter 4 this throne room scene of, of heaven, where the, there's a throne of God. There is a rainbow, a circular rainbow around the throne of God that has this emerald hue, it says. It's a greenish rainbow. We've seen that there are 24 thrones with 24 elders on it. We have seen these, these living beasts, these living creatures, these angels that we talked about last week um, that are, are two weeks ago that were there, uh, there in heaven. And so around the throne, and remember they're worshiping and they're singing constantly, praising constantly. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, right? Who was and is and is to come. And worshiping the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. So last week, we started into chapter 5. We got through to about verse 9, or verse 8. So we're going to pick up verse 9. But those first eight verses, we see that God <clears throat> sees a scroll in the right hand of God right hand of him who sits on the throne, God the Father. And it says there's seven seals on, on this scroll. And remember that I said last week, it's not like you just pop off all these seals. And remember, the only person that can open seals, when you go back to documentation and things, um, you know, back in, in biblical times, they would have, everyone would have their own stamp or their own seal, like for a family. Um, you can certainly see in the Old Testament where they have these signet rings and, and their ring would be stamped on that. Whoever seal is stamped on letters like that, they're the only ones that are allowed to open that letter. <clears throat> okay, so if it has PJ's family seal or crest on it, then none of us are able to open that. We're not supposed to open that. That's his documents. So when we pull out all these documents, everyone knows whose is theirs by this is my seal, that's your seal, that's your seal. <clears throat> Same kind of thing here. No one is worthy to take off these seven seals. And so John gets upset, and an elder, one of the 24 elders, says to him, do not be upset because the line of the tribe of Judah 
right? The one who is the root of David. He is the one who is able to open the seals because He's overcome, which 1 John 5 tells us we are overcomers, those of us who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So we overcome because he is an overcomer. And it says he has conquered hell, he has conquered hate, uh, death, he has conquered sin, he has conquered Satan. He is worthy to open the scroll, to open the seals. And so now as we move forward going into, the ver into chapter 6, <clears throat> I told you we're going to see not him just slicing these things off, but popping one at a time. One seal pops off, and there's a progression. And the story of Re the, the book of Revelation, I do believe, is in a chronological order. A lot of people teach that it is not. And we got to piece it together, and this has to go before this, and this has to go before this, because there's a lot of presuppositions that we have in our minds, a lot of, a lot of us with these um, dispensational teachings and such. But for us, 60 times it says, after this, after these things, then this happened. There's after this, then, then what? There seems to be a progression here of going forward and moving through these things. Okay, so it says that a seal is going to happen, then something's going to happen. The next seal will be open, then something else will happen. We're going to progress through our timeline there in the seven-year period and see what that looks like. Okay, so any um, thoughts, <coughs> questions? We're doing good on time. Um, thoughts, questions, comments? Because I know that was, that was a fire hydrant right there, boy. You know, that was drinking from a fire hydrant. A lot of information coming out at you, and I just want to do a little backup review for especially you two gentlemen who haven't been here to kind of talk about where we are on our thought line of, of eschatology. And I certainly don't want to hog up all the airtime. I'm trying to save my voice a little bit. Any, any thoughts, questions? I just have a question that may sound silly. I don't know. Nah. Where some people think that it's supposed to go in a certain order, they have to put it together. And my thing is that we believe in Jesus, and we know that he risen, and he done this. It, to me, <coughs> the way that it follows in the way he says. It's like they're trying to make sense out of it in the sense that he's not being right about it. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah, and it's tough because, um, you know, there's, there's men that are much, much smarter than I am who believe differently than I do. Um, so... You don't want to say, well, it's easy, it says this. Because to me, my view, it does seem to be right. Because I do think it says what it says. Right. Okay. So, and we do take a more, you know, we take a literal, natural, customary sense approach in our hermeneutics. We read it, and we think what it says, it means. Um, so, not a lot of allegory, not a lot of imagery, not a lot of spiritualizing for us. Where other camps and other teachings do a lot of that. And so that's what I mean by that. Because they spiritualize things or allegorize things, they'll get to some parts of the text and it doesn't really fit in their construct. So they have to twist it and kind of make it fit a little bit, in my view. And, and when it's fulfilled, you know, God will be glorified. We don't want to miss that either. We don't get, get, get so involved in trying to forecast something that we miss the fact that when, when it's fulfilled, it'll be obvious. Good. God will be the tactical manual that it needs to be for Christians at the time and God good. more. Yeah, good call, Duff, right? Because as it comes, believers, true believers, uh, will certainly understand and as, as it gets closer, we will see these things begin to unfold and uh, and we'll know more later as, as to Duff's point. Yes, ma'am? Are you just saying that people make revelations in that order, or mm -hmm. different parts of Bible are they just revelation? Specific, I mean, right particularly now. Revelation, for sure. Because, you know, the preacher of camp will say at verse 1, chapter 4, you know, that means that's where the church is raptured out, remember, before the seven-year period, um, you know, and, and all the, the teachings that we discussed on some of that already. Um, that there's no evidence to that. Again, that's just spiritualizing. That's one man, John, being called up in the spirit, it says in verse 2. In the first resurrection, the rapture is a bodily uh, resurrection. And and you stay, it says, forever to be with the Lord in First Thessalonians 4. Well, in this, John was put back on the Isle of Patmos. He didn't stay forever with the Lord. Like, there's just so many things that they have to make fit. And I think if you just try to read it for what it is, it's one man. It's not representing the church. Um, see what I mean? There's just different thoughts there. Yeah, well, lots of times it says then or after that or this, and then the seals are obviously in order. So how many letters, like, how many letters is Revelation? Like, how much, because obviously it's not separated by the chapters we see yeah. today. So how, one, it's, a, it's, it's just a letter. Just one letter. Yeah, all these books are like letter, you know, is a letter. So, so Jude's a letter, Peter's a letter. Yeah, Revelation. So Revelation is just one. Mm -hmm. Yep. It wasn't founded a bunch. You know what I mean? I'm just wondering if you know. 
Mm -hmm. like, like, you know, Paul wrote a lot of letters or whatever. Yeah. This is one letter. Yep, letter so of John. So why write it out of order? You know what I mean? So, like, well, one yeah. of the things I have a question on, though, in some aspects, is that the timeline it says you will see these things come to happen where Israel will become a nation again. Okay. And that the Jews' capital will be Jerusalem again. And the building of the temple. Right. And some of these things. And it also says that <clears throat> the, the final, what I want to say, seven years, begins when the spirit is taken out of the earth removed from the and earth. I, I understand that thought process and that would be part of part of the you know left behind you know rapture before um, the seven years which, well I just you know, I, I guess I want to have the faith to believe that I'm not going to be around for any of that seven year period I, I don't want sure. to be here <laughs> yeah and I understand believe me no I don't want to be here no one wants to be here and so and so certainly John I, I totally relate with you and, and I understand you know knowing I, your, I, your church background and I had the same background and, and was taught all that but I don't see it scripturally um, I just don't see it because to your point what you started off by saying was Israel we know has to be a nation has to be in the land in order for the Antichrist to set up in the temple well None of those things could even happen until after what 1947. Yep. Uh, Jerusalem wasn't even until 1967. So I think it was 47, 48, when Israel, you know, won their freedom again and, and took over the land. So if the rapture could have happened at any time, how could it have happened before 1947? If Jerusalem wasn't even land before that, do you see what I mean? And I could list like 20 of those things. And I would say to you, one of them is the temple being built and the things that you said. That happens in that seven-year period, which means to tell me we are not taken out before that seven-year period. So, but certainly, love to love to talk to you about it more. Um, it's definitely a lot to a lot to take in. A lot to take. I in. can only say I'm going to be here or I'm not. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And so our thing is, we lean again. It's non-binding. Uh, we certainly don't part fellowship over it. We certainly, uh, you know, respect different opinions. But for us, what we teach is that we will be here. And, and part of the part of the reason, the main reason we do it is because the two pastors see that in Scripture that we see everything relates and says that we will be here. But if we would lean to one side or the other, I would tend to say it's better to lean that it's later rather than sooner because I don't want us to have a false expectation and a false hope of don't worry about that time. You're not going to be here. It's not for you. You're going to be taken out of the way. I would rather you be prepared and be watching and be ready, which is what the scriptures tend to say. So if we happen to say, oh, it's going to be, you know, after the midpoint, it's going to be somewhere later, and it happens that way, then great. Lord willing, you're prepared and ready. Uh, if we happen to be raptured out before that point, then praise the Lord. Amen. Awesome. But if we teach and I say that I'm convinced that we're going to be here out of out of here before that bad stuff happens and it doesn't happen that way and you are here for bad stuff you won't be ready you won't be ready and i believe that's where the majority of the church is today and i believe they will not be ready for that time and i believe we see scriptural evidence of the church when jesus returns will be a weak church and i think that's one of the reasons why personally not just that, that also uh, will inhibit you from doing further, <coughs> further, further work for the Maybe. kingdom of God. Because then you get into that relaxed mode and you say, well, don't worry about that. That's not going to be an sure. issue. And then you kind of stop short of maybe helping somebody else or, you know, Good. you know, seeing further down the future. Good. Yeah, and again, themes, right? And just taking the totality of Scripture, nowhere in Scripture does it say, you won't be here for tribulation. In fact, all of Scripture says the opposite. Scripture says, as a believer, you will have tribulation. You will have trials. You will go through things. You will be purged. The Lord will test you. He will try you. Uh, Jesus says in this world, you will have tribulation. Right? Over and over, James, Peter, you know, Paul, all of them talk about you will have tribulation in this world as a believer. So why for the biggest tribulation that there's ever going to be in the history of mankind would God not have us there? Yeah, over and over it says, yeah. watch, be prepared, be ready. Jesus is saying, watch, be looking for this, be looking for this. Yeah, and we're going to get into that again in Matthew 24. <coughs> well, my question on one of it is, is that who's he talking to for most of this? Is it the believers or is it Israel? Believers. You think so? Because I thought the whole Bible essentially is the story of the Jews. 
But I mean, this is who he's talking sure. about for everything. This is his gift. I mean, I was blessed to get to go over to Israel, and I wouldn't fight for any awesome. of them rocks. I mean, I'm sorry. There's yeah. lots of history there, but sure. I mean, you know, it's kind of like looking here. It isn't paradise like here. Sure, sure. <laughs> well, and then go back to you know First Corinthians uh, 10 or uh, many other places that we can see. Remember that Israel isn't saved just because they're Israel. No. Paul talks about you must believe in Christ. So some people from Israel are believers. Some people who are Gentiles are believers. We know the majority now are Gentiles that are that are uh, believers. So my point is, this book isn't written to to believers, whether they're Jew or Gentile. Does that make sense? So everything that is instruction in here through Matthew 24, through all the, of the Bible, is for who? It's for believers, okay? Um, it's, it's for those who believe in Jesus Christ, whether they're Old Testament Jews or whether they're New Testament Gentiles. Everyone's saved the same exact way. Right, the, the method of salvation hasn't changed, um, so every word in this scripture is for believers. I see this as like the coming of the Messiah, Psalms 20, Isaiah, Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. It told us about the coming of the Messiah and how many people did and, not, and most did not know. No, and the That's same right. thing with Revelation is telling you step by step right. things that are to come. And there's so many people that are getting, you know, yeah. they're twisting it up, or so it's kind of like, yeah, the, the Old Testament warned us the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, yeah. and Good. and how he's coming, where he's coming from, and everything, and they still, even knowing the scriptures, did not see it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, we can certainly talk um, around and around, and we certainly have plenty more time to do that. Um, but we've we've kind of talked about all this stuff a lot, um, so. I know it can be um, interesting, certainly. I know it can be difficult, certainly. But again, we want the Spirit to be our guide and to teach us, um, you know, what he what he has for us. Okay. So let's pick up in verse nine, chapter five. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll go back to eight uh, for context. When he had taken the book or taken the scroll, right? So who is it? The he that had taken the scroll. Christ. Good, Jesus. The four living creatures, those, those seraphim, those angelic beings we talked about, and the 24 elders fell down before the land, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So there you go right there. Who, who was his blood spilled for, and who was it told to, and who is this instructions to? Every tribe, every nation, every tongue, all who will believe. Verse 10, you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked, there's that then again, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the land that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every cre created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for a uh, helpful discussion. Thank you for your spirit that continues to help us, to teach us, Lord. I pray that you would give us understanding in the things that you have for us today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so back to, we've seen this offering of the incense there um, and the importance we talked about last week of prayer, that those are the bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, that it seems God is... Uh, God is storing these prayers up, and they're constantly coming before him and before his throne, okay? Uh, next, it talks about verse 11, the voice of many angels, and it says myriads of myriads, or some versions say ten thousands of ten thousands, I think is what the King James says, and thousands of thousands. Um, so I've got some numbers up there just to be, just to give us a, a little idea that 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million, okay? So you're talking over 100 million if it were to be a literal number. Uh, which I don't think he's trying to tell us, oh, it's exactly 102 million, right? He's trying to give us a, a sense of it's a lot. It's a vast number, okay? It's a big number 
uh, of angels that are there and created beings that are there. And that also gives us an understanding, as I put a little note there, to remember that a third of the angels followed Satan. So understand now, it's a lot of angels. There's a lot of demons uh, following Satan, okay, our adversary and uh, the enemy. So there is a lot of, of the spiritual warfare that we continue to talk about, you know, and that battle that we are, are in. Um, certainly as, who was it, Elisha said to, uh, um, what was his, what was his servant's name? Gehazi, Gehazi, something like that. Um, it said, those who are with us are more than those who are with them, right? Um, and greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world, yes? So we're on the victorious side, we're on the right side, uh, but there certainly are, are many um, angels and demons, okay? <clears throat> This I, I find very interesting. I hope you do as we read through it. And actually, I'm thinking now that it may be another sign. I believe it would be another sign for us because as we believe we're still here at this point, at this time, you know, if we're alive at that. I mean, whoever the generation is that's alive at this time. It says, Every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea praised him. Okay, so I've got Philippians 2.10 written up there. Remember it says, Every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Understand that that means every knee and every tongue created. That doesn't mean just believers. That means, remember, that God is sovereign in all things and he is bringing all things and doing all things for his glory. And that means even those who are non-believers are used for his glory. And so at this point, Look what it says. Every created thing John heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. That means every single created thing is going to say that at some point, someday. Do you see that? That's what it says, right? Amen. So that's what I'm teaching that it says. That's what I believe that it says. And I believe that's going to happen. So... If we're just starting at our timeline and the seals are just about to happen, look, we're here starting into the seven-year period. This certainly could be a sign. I, I mean, do you think, I think we're going to be cognizant of it as believers when it happens, right? So if we see that happen, we're going to be a part of that. We're all going to be saying that, correct? Which we're going to be saying it as believers forever and ever and ever, glorifying and praising the Lord for all of eternity. But this is a pretty significant thing here that every single created thing, look, it says under the earth. What does that mean? What is under the earth? It says everything on the earth. What would created things be Demons. under the earth? Huh? I say the devil. Buried people, worms, bugs. <laughs> talking about people or just creatures, yeah. period. Well, living things on the earth would be like us. Things in heaven would be heavenly hosts and beings and the souls of the saints up there. Things on earth would be humans. Things under the earth would be like in hell. Okay, under the earth, Sheol, hell. Um, so that's what I'm saying. All non-believers that are dead and all non-believers that are alive on the earth at that time. Everyone is going to bow and, and give reverence and give homage and give praise and worship to, to the king. <coughs> Amen indeed. Which is what the four beasts say, right? The four beasts, it says here, uh, kept saying amen. And remember what amen means? Truth. Good, it means truth, right? So they're saying true, true. Like everything, all of creation just resounded in you are holy and worthy and awesome and worthy of our praise and all these things. And they just keep saying amen, 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 amen. That's how it should be, right? That's, that's the truth of what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be praising and worshiping him. And then it says that the beast and the elders fell down and worshipped him. Which, again, we've seen that since uh, chapter 4 started. And, and the beings that are there and the elders that are there, that everything in heaven is just praising and worshipping the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Giving glory and honor to him. Good. So it didn't take us long to get through chapter 5 there. So let's go ahead and, uh, let's go ahead and keep going. We've got some time here. Any thoughts, though, <laughs> questions? Thoughts, comments on, on that part of, you know, every created thing or, or what this may look like. Anything sticking up to you there? Brian, you got any input back there? No, <laughs> I got one input at the end here. It says that even the elders fell down and worshipped him. So as they're, they're talking and, and, uh, and writing about it, they said, oh, we too, you know, everybody, there is not one person that is above God 
at any time, right. even if they are in heaven. You know what I'm saying? That's right. Yep, that's right. Good. Okay, let's start chapter 6. <clears throat> Again, it starts with what? We're then. Okay, then, meaning after what just happened. <clears throat> I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. And when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and another a red horse went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. Verse 5, when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of four living creatures saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a ashen horse, or a pale horse. He who sat on it had the name of death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence by the wild beasts of the earth. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed. I looked, and he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair. The whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to earth as a fig tree cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks uh, and among the rocks of the mountains, and they said, to the mountains and to the rocks. Fall on us and hide us from the presence of the Lamb who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Whew. I would say no one. Okay. Chapter 6. <clears throat> six seals. Let's just go through them. We'll, we'll see how far we get here this morning. we got about 20 minutes. So, Seal number one, and we are going to compare this again. When we went through the Olive Discourse several months, probably three, four months ago, um, I had this chart for you, which I, I've got here on the slide somewhere, of side-by-side -side comparison. Certainly go home and do your homework if you didn't do it before. But go back and look at Revelation 6, side-by-side -side with Matthew 24. What is Matthew 24? Remember, what is that? What's, what's Matthew 24 and also Mark 13 and Luke 17 and Luke 21? What is that teaching on? What is that about? Is Christ telling them what's, what's, what's going to happen before... Good. Coming. And what do we call that? Revelation. Remember? Uh, Remember, he, he teaches it on the Mount of Olives. So what, what's it called? All of the Discourse. Good. The All of the Discourse. Okay? So the All of the Discourse, Matthew 24, line that up with Revelation 6. And we're going we're gonna to see how that um, lines up. Because I believe Jesus is teaching in the All of the Discourse the timeline of what's going to happen in the end times. And John, I believe here, through revelation from Jesus, is giving it more in detail of about exactly what Jesus was talking about in the Olivet Discourse, which John was privy to hearing, yes? Jesus taught John the Olivet Discourse, and now he's unpacking it a little deeper for him and for us. So seal one is a white horse, and a rider has a bow and a crown given to him, and he conquers. So there's this authority right figure, this authority that's been given to this, um, this white horse, this, this rider on this white horse. So most of the camps, most scholars, most camps, whether they're pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, dispensational, all those things, most camps tend to agree on uh, these, these horses and these riders just from the descriptions given 
and what it seems to look like. Okay, so the white horse, uh, I believe, is signifying the Antichrist. The rider on the white horse is signifying the Antichrist, and certainly John tells us in First and Second, Third John that there are many Antichrists. Right, the spirit of the Antichrist has been and always has been around. The spirit of the Antichrist is anyone who denies Christ. But we know we're looking for that one specific Antichrist later who's going to set himself up in the temple, like Daniel tells us, the abomination of desolation. Okay, so, excuse me, that's what um, this white horse, I believe, is impl implicating, is, is this, this person, this Antichrist coming. Don't worry about the Matthew 24 thing, we'll go to the slide here in a moment. Okay. On that, okay. On that white horse, that is that also the Antichrist imitates Christ, because Christ is also coming in a white horse. Amen. And then the crown, Later. That's right. the crown also imitates the Son of God. Good, because the crown would mean authority, authority, right? Good. And he certainly is going to have authority, under, right? We understand that. Satan's going to give him authority to do the things he's going to do in, the, in that tribulation time and then after that. Um, so uh, we know ultimately God is sovereign and over all that, right? So he is allowing this authority and giving this authority for these things to happen and to unfold as well. Good. Okay, the second one, seal two is a red horse and the rider on this horse has a sword to take peace and to kill each other. Okay, so it seems to be pretty clear that these are men killing each other, which we would call war, right? Uh, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars is what Jesus talks about back in Matthew 24, which again, I'll, I'll pop that slide up in a minute and you'll see it all kind of comparatively together. Okay, so um, this red one would be wars, and, and wars maybe that are escalating uh, towards, towards the end time there, okay? The third seal is a black horse. Rider has balances in, in, in his hand. So what would be uh, balances, right? You think of a scale, okay? Think, food. Right, think about a scale. And now this voice comes out and says, uh, a quart of wheat for a denarius. Remember, a denarius, or some may say a penny, uh, that was a day's wa wages, okay? So a quart of wheat would actually be a very small um, portion. It would be like one meal, okay? It'd be like a portion of one meal for like you, for your one person. So you're talking about a day's wage. You work an entire day for one meal, Free lunch. right? So, but understand that means you go out and you fish, you make a couple hundred bucks in a day, right? Well, it's saying that's what it's going to cost you to have a meal, to have any food. So what does that imply? Famine, Famine, right? Famines, um, that the cost is going to rise, supply and demand is going to be out of whack. And that's what this is talking about, a three quarts of barley for denarius. So that's even smaller and cheaper food, if you will, of the first one. So it's saying it's going to cost a lot to be able to even survive, okay? Which means that there's probably famines and pestilence and things like that um, happening and going on at that time. Okay, seal four is a pale horse or, or a... A white horse, excuse me, not a white horse, an uh, ashen horse is what it says here in my, in my NASB. And the rider on it has a name. What's his name? Death. Death. And Hades follows along, okay, and going with him to kill with sword and with hunger, and it says with the wild beasts of the earth. Okay, so again, this is more... Uh, more killing, more death. So we're going to see an increase here perhaps, probably because if there is famine, there's certainly going to be pestilence. There's certainly going to be disease. There's certainly going to be things that are going to be on the rise that are going to be harmful that will be killing people. Okay. So also with the beast, also with the sword, it just seems like a lot of increase in, in violence and in, in, in killing. Okay. Now, I want to go to our slide here because this is what I've got here. These are the beginning of sorrows, or the beginning of birth pangs, is what it says in Matthew 24 at this point. Okay, here's our slide. Hold your spot there. We've got time. Hold your spot there and flip back to Matthew 24. Always want you to be able to see it in your own Bible. Go and look into it later. And again, all through Matthew 24, he's talking to who? His, his disciples, his apostles, believers, right? And he says to them, when you see, when you see, when you see this, when you see this, be watching for this, be watching for this. That question they ask him in the first verse, in the first couple verses there of chapter 24 is, what 
will be the signs. When is this going to happen? And when are the signs of your coming and of the end of the world or the end of the age? So they're asking me specifically, what's going to happen to the temple? When are you coming back? And what should we be looking for? And he does not say, remember, he does not say, don't look for anything because you're not going to be here for that. I'm just going to take you away secretly anytime and you won't be here for that. No, he in fact goes forward to tell them lots of things to be looking for at this time that they need to be mindful of and understanding of and watching. Okay, so that's that's a big deal in our view of what we're believing here and, and as we teach going forward. Okay, so if you look here with me, uh, kind of back and forth on slide and on Revelation, we just went through chapter 6. So you see the white horse, we're saying it's the Antichrist. Look at verse 4 in Matthew 24. Let's just hang on Matthew 24 there and I'll, I'll point them out to you. Jesus said to them, see that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. What's that talking about? Antichrists, plural, right? That are definitely in the world when he was there and since then. But we know that the Antichrist, the, the big one we're waiting for, is still to come on the scene. That's the first thing he mentions here in his discourse. The red horse, next, is taking peace. Okay, wars. Look at verse 6. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. In fact, it's just the beginning. Okay, as, as we're going to see here. So he's going right here, I believe, right in order with our seals. The black horse is the balances and the famine. So let's look at verse 7. Nation will rise against nation, more war, and kingdom against kingdom in various places. There will be famines and earthquake. Seems to fit still, right? Uh, again, we're going right in order. Okay, the pale horse, hunger, death, all those things. I believe we see, we see is, look at verse 9. They will deliver you to what? Tribulation. And they will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And many will fall away. Many false prophets in 11 will, will mislead many. Verse 12. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. In context, that is most people's love for Christ will grow cold. Which is who? The church. Okay, I, I believe specifically uh, Jesus talks about when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in the earth? I think there's many places that we see the trajectory of the church is not on an incline. It's on a decline. We are a remnant, and we are certainly going down versus the secular world. And the secular world we know already hates the church. Okay, it It's only going to grow more and more and more in that direction, correct? Especially when the Antichrist comes on scene, and then the persecution and all those things are going to start to come. Okay? Then he says, look at verse 15, Therefore, when you see, again, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, then know that here's another sign. When you see this, after these things I just listed for you, know now that we're progressing. When does the abomination of desolation happen? Daniel tells us specifically. So when does it happen? It occurs in the middle of the seven-year period. So we're already now in the middle of the seven-year period. You see it? He says, when you see, when you see, watch for this, watch for this. So, I believe the seals are being opened at the beginning of this seven-year period, and they're going to progress as we come through. We're going to see this until the abomination of desolation. When he says next, what is going to happen? There will be great tribulation, and that's, again, that's the time of tribulation. The tribulation is, what is the tribulation? Is it God's wrath upon the world? No, what is it? It's not God's wrath upon his people. He's not killing his own saints. He's not beheading believers. That's not God's wrath. Whose wrath is that? That's the devil. Satan's. That's Antichrist. The tribulation will be from the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist reveals himself until an undisclosed amount of time that Jesus here says, I will end, he says, unless those days, which days? Look at verse 22. The end days. Those days, referring back to date to 21, the days of great tribulation, they will be cut short, meaning cut off, for the sake of the elect. For the elect, saints, the church, the believers. So for the believer's sake, he's going to stop this time because the Antichrist is going to be killing Christians. They're going to be martyred. And Jesus is going to put that to an end when? When he comes in the clouds. That's the day of the Lord. He's going to put a stop to that. He says the tribulation will end at his coming. He says, I've told you in advance, 
Look at verse 27. Just as the lightning comes and flashes from the east to the west, meaning what? You see it all across the sky. It's lit up from this end to that end. It's not going to be secret. No one's going to miss it. Revelation 1.7 says every eye will see it's coming. Okay, this isn't a secret thing that's going to be missed by anyone. Yes, sir. Now, for the elect, for the elect's sake, so that means that answers that we will be here. That's right. That, to me, it does. Yeah, to me, it does. But let's keep looking. My point of, of pausing there is to say this is the beginning of birth pangs. Okay, he says back in verse eight after after the antichrist, after the wars, after the famine, after all those things. He says in verse 8, these are all just the beginning of birth pangs. Remember what that means. Think of the, the imagery here of a, a woman in childbirth and labor. What happens as it goes longer? They get stronger and closer. Stronger. Right. They're, they're longer and stronger. They're closer together. It gets more and more intensified until the birth. Right? It starts off slow, but it's going to increase, 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 increase until the event. Okay, so it's starting off, and he says, these are just the beginning of birth pains. Be patient, and we're going to see later in Revelation the patience of the saints. Well, because believers are going to be very patient through this time. It's going to be very difficult. Okay, so uh, go back now with me to Revelation chapter 6, as we left off there uh, with, what, the fourth seal. I think these next two are very telling. So we'll probably get through them and, and uh, have a couple minutes discussion, and I'll, I'll leave it with you guys to study more, and we'll get into it again next week. Look at uh, the fifth seal. The fifth seal, excuse me, says, verse 9, I saw underneath the altar, remember where is John when he sees this? Heaven. Good. I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who have been slain because of the word of God. So those are what? Martyrs. People that have been killed for the testimony of God. And they cried out with a loud voice. Look at verse 10. This is very telling. How long, O Lord, holy and true, Will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those on the earth? So look here. We are here in the seven-year period, somewhere before the abomination desolation, and the souls, which they're still souls, okay, in heaven, the souls of these martyred saints that have died for the testimony of Jesus Christ are under the altar, and they're saying to God, How long, God? When are you going to avenge our blood on these people. When are you going to pour out your wrath upon those who killed us? You see it? Which implies that what? His wrath has not begun yet. If they're saying how long till you avenge us, he's not avenged them yet. Do you see it? It's pretty simple. That means we're up here almost to the middle point yet and Revelation tells us the wrath of God has not been poured out yet. So for the teaching that the seven year period is the wrath of God, that doesn't hold water for me. And so we don't, we don't teach that. I don't believe that. That seven-year period is not the wrath of God, which is why they say we got to be taken out before that because it's the wrath of God and we're believers, and so that's not for us. Well, does it say here that the seven years is the wrath of God? No, we're in the seven years, and these souls in heaven are saying, when are you going to pour out your wrath? When are you going to do these things? Do you see it? Implying that it has not happened yet. And look at verse 11. He gives them white robes as if to be ready. Well, why would they have to be ready for white robes? Well, I think we're going to see that moving forward. And look, in fact, in the very next seal. What did we say are the signs of the, days of the day of the Lord and Jesus' second coming? What are the signs all through Scripture of the day of the Lord? Sun and moon and stars being darkened. All the way back to Genesis, God said that they are put in the sky for signs and seasons. The signs have been. Some of the stars being darkened is the day of the Lord. Well, if that's what all of the scriptures say in the Old Testament, New Testament, in Revelation, don't you think we should see somewhere then the sun and moon and stars being darkened? Doesn't that make sense? If Revelation is more detail of the end that all of scripture tells us about, and all of scripture says the sign of Jesus is coming as the sun, moon, and stars being darkened, wouldn't we want to see that then somewhere in Revelation? Here it is. Let's look at it. Sixth seal. There was a great earthquake, and the sun became black. The whole moon became blood, and the stars fell from the sky. And look at what he says there. As a fig tree casts its unripe figs. Go back to Matthew 24. Please. Hopefully you're holding your spot there. Because he starts in verse 29 saying, immediately after the tribulation of those days. You see it? Not before, but after. 
the sun and the moon and the stars will be darkened. That's what Jesus says. And then the Son of Man will appear in the clouds with great power and glory and his angels and a great trumpet and gather his people, gather together the elect. What is that? The rapture. That's the first resurrection. It happens after the sun and moon and stars are darkened. It happens after this sixth seal happens here. And then look at verse 32. How amazing is this? Look at what Jesus teaches them in all the discourse. He says, learn the parable of a fig tree. Do you see it? What did John say back there in the sixth seal? As a fig tree cast forth its leaves. Like, you can't make it compare any better. As a fig tree, what does that mean? Well, as the season's getting along, you're going to see the fig tree, the leaves are going to fall off. When they start to bloom again, or, or when they start to fall off, you know what's happening. You know that summer is near. You know that the season is at hand. Why? Because of signs of the fig tree. Because of signs of the things I'm telling you. When you see this, when you see this, when you see this, when you see the sun and moon stars being darkened, he's comparing and giving the analogy of saying, when you see these things happen, know that it is near. And that's what he goes on to say there in Matthew 24 as well. I'm going to pause there so we have a few minutes. We'll get back into uh, into the to, to next week a little bit more. And, sorry, let me go to the last, verse 17, look at the last verse, which tells us again. Now, in verse 5, in the fifth seal, it says, how long before you avenge us, meaning it hasn't happened yet. Look at verse 17 now. After the sun, moon, and stars are darkened, it says, the people hid themselves in the mountains and the rocks. You can go back to Isaiah and see, see that. And it's talked about in Isaiah, I believe, chapter 34. Uh, saying to the rocks and the mountains, fall on us. See what it says there? Fall on us, hide us from the presence of the Lamb. And it says in verse 17, for the great day of their wrath has come. That's present tense, meaning has now come. The day of the, the Lord's wrath is come now at the sixth seal. So look here, do you see it? The first five seals have happened here. When does the sixth seal happen? Right here, wherever the sixth seal happens, is the sun and moon stars being darkened, which is the day of the Lord, which is the day that Jesus comes, and the day that what happens? Wrath. We're saved, and then what occurs? Wrath. His wrath is poured out, which means his wrath is not poured out until the sixth seal, which is already past the middle of the seven years, which means we're here past the middle of the seven-year period. And I know that could be a lot for you two gentlemen, so again, I apologize in advance. But for us, we've been teaching this for eight months, and so you guys know the construct we've built from Old Testament scriptures, New Testament scriptures, all over the place. We're just kind of getting into more detail now, because now you see, we'll draw that up next week. The sixth seal lines up right here at the day of the Lord. It's the sun and moon stars being darkened, and then what's going to happen is the trumpets and the vials of God's wrath will be poured out after the day of the Lord. What happens at the first thing of the day of the Lord? First resurrection, we're out of here. After the time of tribulation, he saves us from the wrath of God. Thoughts, questions, comments? One thing that you said that God, uh, you said God will not find any faith here if he comes or any, what was that you said? Well, Jesus said, he, he was asking them. You know, he said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? And one thing that I see, if all these things happen... And certainly you will. There are believers going to be there. <laughs> right, but if there's but you understand lot, what he meant. If there's a lot of people that believe that they're not going to be here before it happens, and it does happen, they're going to be very upset. So their faith will be tested. I'm sure that it's sure. possible for someone to lose their faith in, in the sense of, like, you know, you know, I was misled or I wasn't ready. Sure. So when Now, people, I would say, just to clarify, because I think I know what you meant, not lose their faith in the sense of losing their salvation, right, but they're, if they're truly they're, saved, but they're losing hope, heart. Hope. Yeah, right, right, right. Exactly. right. Being like, yeah, because imagine, that's where I always kind of put myself yeah. when the Lord changed my, my view on all this, is the teaching that's the main teaching in the church, I believe, is leading people into false ideas. And I do believe that majority of the church will be rendered useless when they're right, still yeah, here for that. Shot. They're going to say, my pastor told me I'm not supposed to be here. You know, like, what else did he say that wasn't true? And uh, you can see how it's going to be difficult yep. for them. Well, now, my big concern is, is when does the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, yep. be removed? Because and I would say that, that to me is the point in time where I don't want to be here. 
So let me answer that, if I may, one, uh, in one minute um, or less, John, and then we can talk about it later. Um, the Holy Spirit will never be removed, ever, because the Holy Spirit is what? Us, it's Christ in us. Well, think about the Holy Spirit. It's part of the Godhead. He, it's omnipresent. That, that whole teaching and that thought of the Spirit of God or the church will be taken out before this time is a teaching that I think is founded on a really bad doctrine and bad teaching. The Spirit of God cannot be taken away. He's omnipresent. Do you understand? And in fact, later in Revelation, it says that those who are tormented in hell will be tormented in the presence of the Lamb forever. So even this thought, I understand what people mean when they say, sin separates you forever from God. I, I know what they mean, but God's everywhere. And they're going to be in eternity in hell in the presence of God. Well, God is three in one. Though. That's right. So he can't remove the Holy Spirit. And, and plus, th there's going to be believers there. So well, uh, if the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, and the Holy Spirit is who draws men to salvation, then no, if, if the Holy Spirit were truly to be able to be removed, no one would ever be saved. Does that make well, sense? No one will be saved after that point ever. Well, uh, but the Bible I, tells us they I will. I don't disagree with you on yeah, that yeah. line. I, get, I guess I just see that the Spirit mm -hmm. is the only thing that we have today in the world, in the world, to know God through. In other words, you get to meet the Spirit when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you're and we would tell you, again. and we would even tell you, you only believe Jesus as your Savior because the Holy Spirit allowed you to do that and did that work in you. So certainly, without the Holy Spirit, no one can be saved. Which is why I don't believe ever that the Holy Spirit could ever but, be removed. But He says Spirit in the world. You mean that? But the Spirit is in us; it's not in the world. Correct. Well, right. Well, the Holy Spirit. Coming, the Holy Spirit. Right. right. Heaven's coming to earth. So. Yeah. Like it's really Him coming down. It's not really any. Yeah, no, I don't believe you can remove the Holy Spirit, and the, the scriptures nowhere I don't believe say that. That's a, another man's teaching, that the Holy Spirit is out of here, which means we have to be out of here before that. that. Again, that's why they say that, is because they believe we're out before the seven years starts. I, I, that's what I'd like to be. <laughs> right. And so I get it. It's a big, complicated thing. Um, but, but again, we have um, YouTube. We have a YouTube channel with the teachings for the last eight months. You know, if you happen to want to listen and... and uh, to hear where we're up, it's hard to catch up, obviously, in, yeah, no, in one no, forty-five minute session. Uh, so, uh, but if you stay, you know, obviously, you're going to continue to to question things and, and question the scriptures. That's what we want to do. We want to work it out, uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling through the Word of God. So, um, Greg, would you pray for us? We've got to close. Thank you, guys. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this study this morning. Thank you for the folks that have been here. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your revelation. Thank you for loving us so much that uh, you gave us your word and opened our, our ears, our eyes and ears uh, to understand your truths. Uh, thank you for our continued blessing. May you continue to put your hedge of protection around this church and its mm -hmm. members. Uh, may you bless over Pastor Craig as we go into our service now. May you find our service, uh, sweet aroma to you, Father. Uh, may we worship you. All your glory goes to you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.